All right, so on that little sign behind me, uh, I just kind of rubbed out the A and put in a UR. Uh, small difference in spelling between nature and nurture, but in psychology, it's a huge difference in terms of how people think about phenomena. Um, and, and for many years, I think it was really uh, an attempt to do an either or. This is nature, this is nurture influenced. Um, but um, over time, we've come to realize that just about every psychological phenomenon is some mix of the two. So I've told you a little bit about the nature perspective. Um, now I want to tell you about the emergence of the nurture perspective and this whole school of psychology called behavior, uh, excuse me, behaviorism that kind of came along with that and embraced that whole nurture aspect of behavior. Okay, so week four, lecture two, the rise of behaviorism or nurture strikes back. Um, yeah, so here's how I would like to frame this for you. I've already kind of set this one up a little bit that, you know, we had all these experimental psychologists doing their thing, trying to say psychology is a science, psychology is a science. And then along came Sigmund Freud with his clinical perspective on things. And suddenly everybody got to know that. Everybody kind of thought, okay, that's what psychology is about. And you could almost hear the more scientifically minded psychologists screaming somewhere in their labs. Um, so this is, behaviorism is going to be a reaction partly to the perception those scientists had that while Freud had interesting ideas, they were not testable scientific theories. And therefore they would not advance psychology. You needed testable theories to advance a science. Um, all right, but he, he did his thing, Sigmund Freud. Um, Darwin, of course, also had, was having a huge influence as, as I highlighted in the previous lecture. Uh, not so much Darwin himself, but as the ripples of his work continued to expand, they touched virtually every area of research. And of course, through things like eugenics, they were starting to touch psychology. Uh, in a very strong way. And, and of course, I already highlighted William James and his functionalist approach to psychology. So clearly it was already there. But eugenics brought in this whole other cloud because you know while people could say it's based on scientific principles, and it kind of was, there was still certainly something very creepy about it and something that a lot of people reacted viscerally as you know wrong, negative, evil um, in some cases. So. Um, imagine this context now. You're, you find yourself as an experimentally minded psychologist. This is the era in which you live in. Freud doing his thing, eugenics kind of living out. And along comes this guy named Ivan Pavlov. And I'm really going to highlight Pavlov today. And yes, all three of these guys are white guys with white beards. You start to think that Santa Claus is in, you know, embodying different bodies and having influences on the world. Um, that's just sort of how early science was, uh, I'm afraid, uh, at least in Western science. So let's highlight Pavlov. Um, and one of the things I like to highlight about Pavlov is um, the role of chance and, and the way he reacted to it. So uh, I'm a dog lover. Uh, I'm, I'm not thrilled by this. This is not a, a living dog, but it once was. This is actually one of Pavlov's dogs preserved. So Pavlov did a lot of his research on dogs. He was actually a physiologist. He was interested in the digestive system. So he had these apparatuses um, hooked up to the dogs. What these apparatuses would do is collect saliva because originally what Pavlov um, imagined his research to be about is he was going to give these dogs various kinds of food and he was curious about how different foods would differentially activate our digestive system and you can measure how reactive the digestive system is by how much saliva is in the mouth so if something really kicks in our digestive system we produce a lot of saliva and so this was essentially a measuring instrument to detect how much saliva was being produced. Okay, everything good so far, except here's what happened while they were trying to do these experiments. Um, early on, things seemed to work okay. They could prepare some kind of food, they put it in the dog's mouth, and when they put it in the dog's mouth, they would see this sudden change of drooling corresponding to the presence of the food. But after not many trials, something kind of annoying started happening. As soon as 
the events were happening that predicted food. So specifically, as soon as some research assistant or somebody started to prepare the food or even go to the cupboard where the food was held or anything like that, suddenly the dog started drooling. It didn't have any food in its mouth at all, uh, but it was already salivating before the food came in the mouth. Now, a lot of scientists could, could view this as just a real nuisance, like crud, how can I measure the change in drool, saliva, as a function of food in the mouth if there's a change of saliva salivation that's already occurring before I put the food in the mouth? What the heck is going on? Well, what was going on was learning. This dog and his compatriots were quickly forming associations between the preparation of food and the ultimate presence of food in their mouth. And so they were reacting to the preparation almost like they already had food in their mouth. And Pavlov recognized that for what it was and said, wow, this is really cool. This is perhaps more interesting than my original research question. I want to study that learning. And ultimately he called that kind of learning classical conditioning. Um, and he formalized it in the following way. So here's, here's a, a trial he would use. And here's some of the, um, some of the uh, terminology that goes along with it. It's a bit of a clumsy terminology in my perspective, but I'll try to make it make sense uh, for you as we go through. So we start off by talking about um, an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. Uh, two things to help you with the terminology. First, think of the word conditioned as the word learned. So an unlearned stimulus and an unlearned response. Conditioning was what Pavlov referred to as the procedure in which learning occurs. So it, the, the link between this stimulus and this response did not require any learning. It was already there. It was unconditioned. It was just there, present, right from the, the get-go. The other thing to, to note, and I've already kind of alluded to this, is we're not really talking about the stimulus and we're not really talking about the response. We're talking about the link between them. So to think about this, if you put food in a dog's mouth, the dog will salivate. That is a natural, automatic, physiological response. So there's a link between food and salivation, this stimulus and that response, that does not have to be learned. It's there when we're born. It's unconditioned. So people refer to that as the unconditioned stimulus of food provoking the unconditioned response of salivation. Okay, so the dog has that when they come into the lab. Now, first time the dog's in the lab, let's say we blow a whistle. And we ask, are they going to salivate when I blow a whistle? Well, why would a dog salivate when you blow a whistle? Uh, and so originally, before conditioning, before learning, they do not salivate. Okay, so we can talk about this, this um, whistle initially as being what we call a neutral stimulus that does not produce any learned response because the animal hasn't learned anything yet. Okay, um, No salivation. But now here's the interesting part and this this phase three would happen repeatedly over and over and over. So what we would do is whistle and then give them food. And of course the food will produce a salivation response. That is an unconditioned response to the unconditioned stimulus of food. But we do this over and over. Whistle, food, dog salivates. Whistle, food, dog salivates. Whistle, food, dog salivates. Do that over and over and over and then we do our test trial. And our test trial is we blow the whistle. We don't give food. We just blow the whistle. And what you'll typically see is salivation. It's a slightly different salivation. Let me come back to that. But you see salivation. So this dog compared to before conditioning now, after conditioning, when you blow the whistle, it will salivate. And we now call this a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. We have taught the dog this connection between the whistle and salivation. So it has learned to salivate to the whistle. So we call this now a conditioned stimulus, which produces this conditioned response. Now, you might go, hey, wait a minute, I thought salivation was an unconditioned response. Now we're calling it a conditioned response. This is why I, I refer to that link. It's not so much salivation, it's salivation in response to the whistle. That had to be learned. That's why we call that a conditioned response. This is salivation in response to the food. That did not have to be learned. 
That's why we call it unconditioned. And in fact, if you look at the two salivations, the artist has tried to depict this a little bit, they're different. Um, the, the, the nature of the salivation will be different. It could be more or less, usually less. The, the artist actually has depicted it as more, but it's usually less salivation to the conditioned stimulus than to the real one. Um, okay, so he showed you can do this. You can condition animals to, uh, in this case, salivate, but to do all sorts of things. They're forming some sort of prediction. They're learning that the whistle is going to predict the occurrence of food, and therefore they start to react to the whistle the same way they would react to food. So their typical response to food gets transferred now to the whistle, and they will now salivate to the whistle. All right. So Pavlov was doing that, and that led the way to a bunch of different kinds of experiments. So here's just one sense. If you're doing these learning trials, and you say, how many learning trials do you do before you test? And then when you test, how many drops of saliva do you get? And what you see is after a couple learning trials, not many, but very quickly, the animal is learning. And, and after about six or eight learning trials, he's salivating quite a bit um, after learning. And so then an interesting question was, okay, you do more trials, it doesn't really make a difference. He's kind of learned it by now. He's what we call asymptoted. Um, but what if you now start just blowing the whistle and not giving food? And you blow the whistle and, not, and don't give food. And blow the whistle and don't give food. Well, you see that eventually the animal stops drooling. When the whistle no longer predicts food, they stop drooling. And that's what we call extinction. The CS, conditioned stimulus, the whistle alone. Okay? And we see extinction. Now if you give it a little bit of a rest and you come back, one of the things you see is what's called spontaneous recovery. The, the animal was down here, but the next day when you blow the whistle, it drools quite a bit again. It, it's almost like it's like, ooh, is the game still on? But then if we just give the CS alone, it extinguishes again, goes back down. We wait 24 hours, there's a little tiny bit of spontaneous recovery again, but just a tiny bit, and then it goes down flat. Okay, my point in this is, look at that. That's data, <laughs> all right? And to the experimental-minded scientist, this was science. This was not asking people what they saw in their head. This is looking at a very objective measure of drops of saliva, something you can measure very clearly, and how that changes as a function of what you're doing to the animal. This was really good science. And it had something to do with psychology because it's about learning. So the experimental psychologists were like, wow, okay, now we're talking. Okay, this is the answer to Sigmund Freud. This is a scientific approach to a psychological issue of learning. Um, and also, in this age of eugenics, this kind of data showed, and you know what? This is about the environment. This is about the animal learning associations and learning how to adapt its response, its responding um, in light of them. So this is not genetics. This is learning. This is environment. This is nurture. And so suddenly all of this behaviorist data, and it really did become a, a whole school of psychology, um, was a real answer, a real sort of antidote to some extent to the strong push for the influence of genetics. All right. Now all of this was embodied uh, primarily in the character of somebody named John B. Watson. Um, we've talked about John B. Watson before. I told you about the Little Albert experiment. Remember when he conditioned fear responses? And um, John B. Watson was not shy about his claims. He thought that through behavioral techniques you could explain everything there was to know about human psychology. So he really th thought behaviorism was the way, um, the way forward for psychology, uh, a really scientific approach that could provide all the answers to all the questions. Uh, and he said that you know, very loudly and clearly and ultimately started this whole school of psychology that will be the focus of, of this week's lectures, a school called behaviorism. All right, so a little bit of reading uh, and videos. Uh, first of all, uh, this is uh, Philip Zimbardo talking about classical conditioning. Uh, so he will walk you through some of what we just described with a little bit more video. Um, this is a, a kind of funny college example of a guy classically conditioning his roommate. Um, but a really nice example of, of the process applied to humans. So you'll see that it applies quite well. Uh, and here's a link back to that little Albert experiment and talking about John Watson uh, in general. And you'll see how you know, he really saw this as a direct response 
to eugenics and, and some of the pushes about uh, genetic influences. So you'll get that nature-nurture um, vibe happening here. Um, on the reading side, um, this is, this is uh, the actual Nobel Prize, uh, an article about the Nobel Prize acceptance from Ivan Pavlov in 1904. So if you want to get more of a sense of, of that. Um, and this is just a reading about classical conditioning, um, giving you a real good sense of, of classical conditioning and how it works. Um, a, a lot of what we covered, but just you know another perspective on it. All right, so that's cool. So now we, we have our combatants. We have you know nature and nurture. We're really going to be emphasizing the nurture part uh, in the rest of this chapter because it's really going to focus on behaviorism, how behaviorism grew, and how it applies to our real life. All right, fun journey. Hope you come along.